Sega and the short-lived novel trade aka Appalooza's Echo franchise. Known to be groundbreaking in terms of graphics and gameplay, it's also known to be very, very hard as well. And now... Kicking off the lineup, the original Echo for the Genesis, circa 1992. This first installment we're experiencing here, which obviously needs no introduction whatsoever for all the veterans, revolves around the eponymous five-star bottlenose dolphin, who, and forgive any minor spoilers in advance, after his entire pod and extensive marine life community are helplessly and savagely devoured, discovers that the entire planet and its many oceans throughout are being plagued by a chaotic-ass force on account of ruthless fucking off-world extraterrestrials lingering both deep under these oceans and far above the Earth alike and must travel through every single one of them, the oceans that is, and through time alike, to confront and eliminate their asses by any goddamn means necessary! Now, in terms of gameplay, as many might have figured out by now, it's far from your average-ass, run-of-the-goddamn-mill, underwater exploration romp, where you're assuming control of the aforementioned five-star Terceops Echo, and a little fun fact slash trivia for everyone, Terceops is the scientific name for the bottlenose dolphin, obviously, traversing through not only his own home, but throughout every surrounding ocean and underwater structure as well, solving every perplexing-ass puzzle, overcoming every intense-ass hurdle, and then some. Before I forget, the left path in the introductory cave leads to the passwords, considering they're always regenerated at random every time you die during any scene. Likewise in the sequel, not to mention the Game Gear and CD counterparts of both installments. But more on these later. Control-wise, the D-pad migrates Echo anywhere of his own free will, especially above the surface to regain his air. A lets him sink via sonar, thereby communicating with other animals, and even access the map by holding it down for a second or so via echolation, which I'm guessing his name comes from, thus redirecting his sonar signal prior to that. B lets him dash and peck in the water, thereby catching smaller fish to replenish his health, or attacking every opposing foe, and C lets him accelerate while swimming. The two meters at the top left are for his health, in a dark blue-gray hue, and his air, in a much lighter whitish-blue hue, both of which deplete when Echo withstands any damage from common hazards and or enemies, and when he spends way too much time underwater regardless of his efforts, but at a noticeably stagnant momentum, respectively. And to be precise, Echo can only survive underwater for no longer than a minute and a third, as opposed to a real-life dolphin that can only survive for 8 to 10 minutes. Shit, as if I'm not up on my fucking oceanography? In certain cases, the latter will clash with the former, and that the health meter will also deplete when its air supply is completely dissipated. Hence, isn't it obvious why it's important to reach any ocean surface? You're forced to restart every fucking adventure should Echo's health also completely dissipate. Or, in layman's terms, should he croak, push up daisies, cash in his chips, or, in the case of this franchise, make the final fucking dive into Davy Jones' locker, hence where those randomly generated 8-digit letter-based passwords are implicated, and expect to be greeted by them every motherfucking time Echo gets his ass, or should I say his fins, handed back. Also, don't expect any goddamn checkpoints either! Anyhow, his quest begins upon not only communicating with the other dolphins via sonar and practicing his other abilities, but also performing his epic so-called leap of faith, more like a so-called leap of suspense thereby setting off that accidental storm and causing the entire undersea community to be spirited away, one creature after another, which for the record has jack shit to do with the Ghibli film, including Echo's own fucking pod no less, while being suspended, after which he's left sold to fend for himself. I mean, God, talk about the shit hitting the fan. Were any of you expecting this game to be another everyday, typical-ass, light-hearted, kitty-grade material crusade? Consider yourselves worlds beyond mistaken, since there are precisely 26 stages, well, 27 if you include the final battle against the infamous Vortex Queen, known to harvest all marine life every half millennium, I might add. 
starting from Medusa Bay, where everything's pretty much a walk in the park in terms of discovering and communicating with a killer whale, aka what I like to call one of Shamu's long-lost cousins. Not to mention the two connecting gems, referred to as Key Glyphs and Barrier Glyphs, the latter two of which serve as the most crucial and mandatory feature of any, in fact, scratch that, every environment Echo explores, and to top it off, they also grant Echo new abilities, including the deterioration of rocks. The other caves, the vents, and the lagoon are where there's no margin for pissing about whatsoever. Swarms of pufferfish, a shell needed to break down rocks when guided and aimed at the right angle, strong-ass underwater currents the power swim and dash through, a huge-ass octopus, which you have to swim very, very gradually past, or it'll bitch strike your ass down the first chance it gets. And don't get me started with the missing fellow dolphins you have to rescue while guiding a boulder down through every upward forcing current, some of who will award you two sonar-enhanced songs that'll make even the hungry ones looking at you, sharks. Not just the minor aquatic adversaries, your forever bitches in no time flat, and even confuse the shit out of their rabid, relentless asses before reaching every interconnecting cave and returning to every connecting glyph to access the next and or previous paths. The circle of starfish, also mandatory for breaking rocks while also keeping the often respawning jellyfish and sharks at bay, the frigid ice zone, followed by the hard, cold, and deep waters, all with the obvious exception of the latter, involve surviving through sub-zero settings that damn near defy both the North and South Poles, and fuck no, it has dick all to do with Mortal Kombat whatsoever. and eventually meeting up with a legendary ancient blue whale, Big Blue, as he regales you of how Echo lost his entire pod while living out the last few moments of his doomed-as-fuck existence, but informs you of yet another organism that possesses all sorts of knowledge far beyond those of both the Big Blue and Echo himself, and yes, even including us humans, hence where the latter destination is involved. <laughs> At the very end of deep water is where the mythical organism in question, which resembles something of a massive DNA strand, makes its debut, hence the Asterite, who then commands Echo to travel back 55 million years in time via a machine in order to retrieve one of its lost globes from the fabled Atlantis, hence its four locations. The Marble Sea, the Library, Deep City, and the City of Forever, where you must retrieve more mind-blowing clues from not only the usual glyphs, but also the historic statues, and gain access to the aforementioned Time Machine, which warps them straight into a plethora of prehistoric landscapes. Comprised of Jurassic Beach, which involves Echo summoning a pterodactyl out of nowhere upon bumping into a sawing glyph in order to access other impossibly restricted areas. Pteranodon Pond, same shit and deal as earlier, Origin Beach, and Trilobite Circle, with the latter two featuring those infuriating as shit trilobites and seahorses who'll rape your senses worse than the infamous Marquis de Sade, Jeffrey Dahmer, Takakazu Abe, and God forbid Brad Whitewood Sr. from at close range combined. I mean, who the hell else besides yours truly isn't sites that the former are already goddamn extinct long the fucking Christ before now? Dark Water, which, yet again for the record, is in no way tied with the short-lived animated series created by David Kirshner of Child's Play fame for the already defunct Hanna-Barbera, where Echo goes up against the corrupted Asterite, who, for some unbeknownst reason, has thrown his ass under the goddamn bus, more like chucked his ass into a giant fish grinder machine. Yeah, I know, brutal as fuck. And as a quick hint, only aim for and peck at four of the same colored orbs in its strand in a specific order, and perform a swift swim to dodge its electric beams whenever necessary. Otherwise, consider yourself royally fucked. A string of revisits through the very same deep water. City of Forever, Atlantis, and the home bay areas. Leading up to the Vortex spaceship's inner vacuum through which all life forms are caught up and consumed, hence the tube, which is jack shit to do with TVs, by the way, complete with suction machines and even its own share of electric beams. 
followed by an auto-scrolling shitstorm of an inner sanctum, welcome to the machine that is, which evidently is a reference to Pink Floyd I might add, inhabited by those dreaded vortex drones and hazardous walls which are grind echoes ass in a starkest if your guiding expertise happens to shit the bed at any juncture. <laughs> And finally, the earlier announced, long-awaited confrontation against the voracious Vortex Queen herself, hence the last fight, and make sure to avoid being consumed by her vacuum while pecking and firing away at her weakest points. Unless you're well aware of your surroundings and how to navigate within every environment, present and past alike, not to fucking mention planning out every common yet crucial offensive strategy before taking on all of the often deliberated aquatic adversaries, be prepared to get lost and perplexed more often than Neville Longbottom from the Harry Potter franchise, and to have your overall mental senses desecrated worse than both a goddamn brain tumor and Dio from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure combined, hence the focus of our next subject. However, there are some beneficial elements that'll somehow alleviate and even out these and other mentally draining struggles, the most notable of which being the shell in the undercaves and or the rocks in the lagoon and other areas meant for deteriorating the rock barrier and traveling through the rough underwater currents individually that respawn in case you deliberately half-ass any attempted plan of path creation, more of which I'll also advocate as this develops. For the time being, at least the rudimentary controls are sustainable and straightforward enough for one to adapt to, despite oh what a raging buzzkill they can be at times. Likewise for the overall gameplay structure, about which I still intend to reserve my innermost qualms, and then some. Regarding Echo the Dolphin's Challenge, speaking of which, consider that our keyword for this, its sequel, and everything else yet to be discussed further, cause, yet again, I wouldn't expect a cakewalk out of either of them. Make no mistake, and have no illusions whatso mother goddamn fucking ever, this game won't hold your hand or suck your dick. So I strongly suggest entering it with more than just an open mind and a fully grown pair of stainless steel nuts. For starters, attention to your overall surroundings is key, apart from Echo's mandatory yet repetitive oxygen management habits, especially when attempting to perform vast leaps from one body of water to another over land, or slipping through in the ice zone and the next three arctic settings without, and I must stress, without, colliding into any of the spikes, simply via sea I might add, not to mention being punctual and on the mark with every beneficial aid or environmental element, including the circle of starfish, which will disappear if you and or they linger too long. Weaving in through impossibly cramped spaces between the reefs and the spike rows, and even the ice blocks in the Arctic seas, bumping into one key glyph relative to either a nearby or faraway barrier glyph in order to access the next section, the latter of which will obstruct your path if you ignore the former, all while keeping the often recurring quote-unquote sea predators at bay. And the less I say about the stingrays and both the normal crabs and spider crabs, let alone the only two fucking boss confrontations ever against the asteroid and the fucking vortex queen, the better. Like everything else, those pretty much fall within trial and error territory, as you may end up being made their bottlenose bitch, should your efforts happen to travel upward through Piss Creek mixed with Steve O's sperm, Dave England's feces, and Seth Rogen's own vomit during an endless hailstorm. But as long as you're clear and dead on enough on which objective to uphold, and how often you rely on that map, which, as I regretfully forgot to mention, when Echo lets out his sonar, he must be positioned in the exact same direction while holding down A before activating. His journey should at least be tolerable enough to endure, even with the clams that release bubbles of extra health if you call to them, apart from Dash pecking at the fish, but I wouldn't hold my breath in the least. Luckily, in true Shikan the Forever Man fashion, there's infinite lives for Echo, despite once again being forced to start every area from square goddamn one, plus those earlier recounted, randomly generated 8-digit letter-based passwords due to how insanely long this game and its sequel are. Either way, I take to heart every amicable inkling I've outlined thus far to ensure Echo's never-ending struggle-filled quest is all worth his existence, his own missing pod, and most fucking importantly, my own god-given sanity if I were you. To express how undeniably remarkable and stunning the graphics are, even for a 16-bit underwater exploration title from over three decades no less, would be considered yet another quote-unquote understatement of the millennium. Echo by himself shines through and through, defying both the sun and moon fused together, both at the title sequence and in-game alike, with the extreme latter involving his customary, god-given, or in this particular case, what I like to call programmer-embedded abilities. Notwithstanding all the other fellow dolphins from both this pod and the other isolated pods in every area resembling him, but who the hell am I to make any bullshit comparisons, right? Scenery-wise, 
the majority of every undersea environment emulates those in real life. And to be frank, I hope the designers are still patting themselves on the back even to this day thanks to what they've accomplished. I'm looking at you especially at Annunziata, despite its then ongoing conflicts with Sega themselves at the time, right with the usual marine botany, coral, and numerous other sea life serving as either Echo's much deserved nourishment, his most fierce antagonist that puts even the fucking Darius bosses to absolute shame, or occasional allies that need some sort of aid or provide essential info, specifically the whales, the isolated fellow dolphins, the big blue, the asteroid, and others, thereby far exceeding the Genesis's limitations. The addition of the prehistoric creatures, namely the pterodactyls, seahorses, and those vicious, long since extinct trilobites, doesn't disappoint at all either, nor do the last few areas when Echo approaches the Vortex's home planet, from which they've staged their aggressive string of invasions, let alone the symbiotic visual effects taking place within the very vicinity of these environments. About the only common downside I've heard through the grapevine time and time again is how perplexing the foreground and background elements of certain environments can appear, whether they're hazards or participating decorative add-ons, despite myself being capable of distinguishing between the two without any strain whatsoever. I mean, need the hell I express more for pissing out loud? In terms of music and sound, orchestrated by the incomparable Spencer Nelson, also responsible for numerous other Sega CD soundtracks, including the CD versions of both this and its soon to be discussed sequel, no less, The Tides of Time, in collaboration with Brian Coburn and Andras Magyari, the choice of tracks are nothing short of euphoric and serene, with blends of dark and cataclysmic themes that defy even the capabilities of Harold Faltermeyer, Brian Eno, Hans Zimmer, and the late Michael Kamen combined complete with a variety of mood setters that very much fit every central scene and or event Echo endures. Though the Sega CD port's own original batch of songs far beyond trump what we're experiencing here, but I humbly digress. While a few songs are reused in other events, a fair amount of which won't be further described since they all pretty much speak for themselves. At least there's a thread of variety incorporated within each of the other remaining selections. In the most irreversible honesty one could possibly possess or muster, I wish I could express the same about the quote-unquote mixed bag variety of sound effects. While at least a few are bearable at first and later on throughout any potential run, the most infamous of all are Echo's often ranted shrieks when he gets injured, which can dramatically grate on your nerves more often than your first ever high school girlfriend, and expect a lifetime of distress from that one feature every motherfucking time. Though the only other inkling I could suggest is to to not let that shit deter you much from an otherwise ultimately breathtaking and mind-blowing 16-bit underwater experience. Before I proceed any further, take note of my top 5 songs displayed here, with 3 honorable mentions included. <laughs> Wise, feel free to refer to what I've been deliberating over thus far regarding all the mandatory survival and maneuvering tactics, as it should be obvious why many have harbored a love-hate relationship with this particular title throughout the decades, not to mention everything else yet to be showcased down the line, thanks entirely to more than just these, but also the sci-fi elements intertwined with the overall story, the incomparably exhilarating amazement, mystery and suspense of underwater exploration, and most importantly, the ability to rethink said tactics, especially when trekking through the most gargantuan ass, mindfuck-worthy labyrinths that make even the fourth zone of the same name in the original Sonic. All three acts, no less, look like any theme park-style ghost maze or trap room in history, or to top it all off, when going toe-to-toe -to -toe with every fierce-ass adversary inspired by prehistoric and extraterrestrial beings, not just goddamn modern-day aquatic life. All the usual gloating and round the bush beating aside, I definitely give the original Echo the Dolphin more than just a worthy shot. Which therefore brings us to Exhibit B, Echo the Tides of Time, released two years later. Picking up right the fuck where its precursor left off, and as we're about to witness eventually, 
while our main dolphin defender explores an underwater cave and a measurable goddamn earthquake ensues, thereby causing a full-on deep-sea avalanche. Upon his recovery, Echo finds out upon leaving his pod that the asteroid's been obliterated to fucking dick all, and its powers have instantly vanished to jack shit, all thanks to a mysterious yet familiar fucking creature and or anomaly spreading immense fear amongst all ocean life, including, yet again, Echo's own pod. Who or what is that mysterious yet familiar anomaly responsible, one might ask? Only one way for Echo to find out, thanks to the help of a distant descendant from the future. Despite being business as usual like the previous outing, it should be obvious how there's a ton of new, unexpected changes incorporated here. Not to mention more challenging trials, more fearsome adversaries, more unprecedented and astonishing scenery, and get this, fucking undersea warp gate portals. Starting at the customary home bay, these warp gate portals, depending on where you find them, and the accompanying difficulty mode you desire the most, easy or hard, devised by the ever so wise Atlanteans, transport Echo from one area to another, introduced by his random mirror image, likewise for later random areas, exhibiting the pseudo 3D feature that predates Exo Squad by at least a year, no less, as he dives above the surface or swims underneath through as much rings as possible while keeping the goddamn Cochleas and or other adversaries at bay. I'm looking at you especially, Sharks. And don't even fucking get me started with the seaweed and lilies either amongst other common marine-related hazards, until the warp eventually takes effect. In addition, the map range when Echo accesses it via sonar is a hell of a lot wider and far less cramped than last time, and Echo's now capable of leaping off of solid and jagged ground alike more often than before while away from water. Itinerary-wise, after attempting to fuse four glyphs near a sunken ship in Crystal Springs, Echo gains that so-called rock deterioration sonar ability. The next area thereafter, Fault Zone, is where Echo finds himself in even deeper crustacean shit than before. Upon moving a rock along the undersea realm, the powers and infinite oxygen he gained from the asteroid earlier have been disabled during that avalanche, as I've just pointed out, due to the asteroid's unexpected demise, in which case it's back to the old basics of reaching any surface and or air pocket yet again. <laughs> Anyhow, upon reaching two tides, not only does a turtle appear, mainly used as a current barrier, the all-new Pulsar ability makes its debut, with which Echo can summon an area of four-way diagonal sonar waves, simply by tapping A twice in quick succession. As does Echo's distant future descendant, Trellia, with whom he travels through time and introduces him to the so-called water tubes that instantly elevate Echo to imaginable heights above the ocean surface as long as, uh, I don't know, there aren't any goddamn hazardous obstructions. From the water tube in the skyway, yet another extreme, mentally draining, auto-scrolling plethora of scenes is introduced, where Echo traverses through patches of wavy tubes far above the Earth, namely the Sky Tides, Tube of Medusa, and the Aqua Tubeway, during which your ass may be sent back two areas if he inadvertently plummets off of said patches or through the randomly formed holes. And as per usual, don't even motherfucking get me started with those infamous, annoying as fuck, gigantic, two tentacle dick burrito squids, referred to as the Medusa, that'll piss and puke uncontrollably all over your experiences in ways no one's ever imagined if your strategic approaches turn out to be ass-backwards and askewed beyond belief. The Skylands where Echo levitates by singing to the bubbles in order to reach every floating miniature pool island born from the great eruptions, while also floating with a future dolphin kind and keeping the goddamn sharks off your ass. Not to mention various new situations where Echo can transform into different animals and organisms via the metasphere, starting with a seagull, and in other cases a badass shark, a puny-ass jellyfish, a school of normal fish, and, get this, even one of the goddamn extraterrestrial piss and vortex drones. Take note that you'll morph back upon enduring any damage from any environmental hazard or descending on any ocean. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
repairing broken key glyphs and absorbing them before reuniting with the asteroid in its own deep sea cave, which not only advises Echo to return back to his present in order to once again confront and exterminate the very same Vortex race, thereby negating the inevitable manifestation of their so called Vortex future. also provides a spheric portal to said time period, if you're capable enough of reaching the very bottom without getting your ass crushed. <music> Leading to a mission involving the rescue of a school of lost baby orcas, thus reuniting them with their single parent, a mom to be precise, four on easy and eight on hard. plus various other scenes in terms of keeping up with another random cocky-ass dolphin in order to regain that very same stone-shattering song from earlier, following which yet another rescue mission of a lost orca ensues under a half-illuminated slash illuminated sea, with the former being possible by singing periodically, leading up to a time-consuming and tedious-as-fuck wild goose chase, or should I say a wild relic chase, to seek out and recover all of the asteroid's isolated globes, two of which Echo can possess at a time, by the way, in order to regain his infinite air and ultimate sonar powers, thanks to all the Vortex Queen's bullshit envisioned by other surviving creatures while not only traversing through even more extreme mindfuck-worthy mazes, but also feeding your mirror image a single fish, literally. <laughs> swimming alongside a gargantuan-ass pot of blue whales in big water prior to crushing a tower of rocks, taking on a shelled red moray eel, more eagles, cochleas, crabs, and even more of those infamous fucking Medusa jellyfish that appear in various sizes, raising hell while taking on the form of a fucking shark via the metasphere, plus the return of the now-advanced Vortex drones in the extraterrestrially inhabited Lunar Bay, some of whom later managed to drag Echo's ass into the fabled alternate dark future while sacrificing theirs. directly to a fortress in set time period, minus any water whatsoever, except via the pre-constructed waterway tubes, which Echo has no other alternative but to hop all over while evading every motherfucking pit. And yeah, there are checkpoint glyphs included there, unlike every motherfucking where else! Leading up to the Globeholder's Fortress, where Echo confronts said machine in question, before reclaiming the absolute final pair of the asteroid's isolated globes and returning to the present. <laughs> And lastly, when Echo shifts back to possessing infinite air, we're taken to the Vortex's new auto-scrolling hellspawn of a hideout, reminiscent of their so-called infamous machine from last time. before facing off against the latest, red-shaded, massive-tongued incarnation of the also-returning Vortex Queen, guarded by a single laser beam, who'll send your ass into an alternate maze if you get accidentally devoured, and hence, that's where that earlier predicted Vortex Drone transformation is involved. But miraculously, you'll get sped out back to normal if you survive. And before I forget, there's a special string of epilogue areas following your return to home bay, plus a much more nerve-wracking rendition of the first-ever teleport sequence, minus Crystal Springs, and even a top-secret password, about which I'll reveal further eventually, or you can explore it for yourself, your choice! <laughs> Other than everything else, the same pillar of hints I've managed to advocate for the original Echo apply here, to which I strongly suggest referring back, with more I'll also touch on in addition to those regarding this sequel. 
Once more, the controls are about the same as before, notwithstanding the minor issues still existing that many tend to agonize and get easily pissed off over occasionally, but can be simply alleviated thanks to one's own intuition and awareness, and have also improved thanks to the land-leaping physics, ditto for the customary, if dramatically altered, gameplay structure. Therefore, why bitch about anything else? Challenge-wise, as is the very case with the previous Echo offering, the Tides of Time will rake your fucking nuts against the Chiefs Grader and have them fed to the Mountain Lions. Granted, what we're dealing with here isn't as severe as before, depending on which mode you experiment with via one of the two difficulty-based paths in the introductory cave at the beginning, but I wouldn't expect much of a campaign worth stealing hummus from a poor, struggling immigrant family, but I humbly digress. While we're on the subject of the warp gate portals, however, there's so much shit for which to keep the most intuitive watch while attempting to swim or leap through every ring, not just the aforementioned cochleas, but also the seaweed, lilies, sharks, and other random ass obstructions, and if you miss more than two rings, let alone use sonar on any of them, your ass is sent back to the start of the previous area you were in prior to reaching said warp gates. In other cases, the rings will criminally spiral around Echo, therefore, exact positioning is mandatory as fuck. Likewise for the fights against the infamous Globe Holder and especially the newly reincarnated Vortex Queen. Regarding the former, don't just sonar on that mechanical piece of shit. When the arms are detached, just keep sonaring away before they start reattaching back to the latches. <laughs> Eventually, when the arms are taken out, just keep repositioning yourself 90 degrees clockwise away from the motherfucker, and if possible, shift direction whenever necessary, counterclockwise that is, before Echo's ass gets crushed. And yet fucking again, don't get me started with the attempts at keeping up with every supporting creature either, especially the last baby orca near the second half of the asteroid's cave after saving the other three and or seven baby orcas of the four and or eight respectively depending on the mode you're playing on once again and reuniting them with their mom. Let alone the Dolphins and Four Islands, both by the names of Blackfin and Tara, individually, who will bestow Echo the usual Rock Obliteration Sonar song, and lead him to the Sea of Darkness, not to mention one that'll even lead you to the return of the rare Invincibility Glyph, which you're forced to endure all over from the start if you happen to deliberately isolate yourself from the aforementioned supporting creatures, regardless of whether or not you're familiar with their intended paths. Let alone the Tube of Medusa, where you have to haul ass, or in this case, swim ass, at the speed of even Sonic, yet another Sega icon, obviously. DC's Flash and Marvel's Daredevil combined through the tides above Earth, past those fucking jerk-off jellyfish bastards while staying within the tubes without accidentally plummeting outside of them, likewise for both the Sky Tides and the Aqua Tubeway, minus the goddamn Medusa jellyfish, that is. In addition, while hunting for and recovering all of the asteroids' isolated globes, the same penalties apply should you happen to inadvertently bump into any solid ground underwater or dash too far when carrying one of said globes. What's even more fucked up? For those that recall the starfish circle, meant for obliterating the racks from the previous outing, they're even worse than the maze of stone, cuz, as I've advised earlier, they'll vanish if you piss about too long with them, especially while attempting to guide the little pricks to the next barrier of stones, in which case, you'd have to return to their spawning point every mother goddamn fucking time, well, despite another ring conveniently appearing halfway. <laughs> But that's not the worst of it all, nor are the two machine areas starting with the Dark Sea leading up to the fight against the Red Vortex Queen. Oh shit, no! Getting back to that three-part epilogue involving Echo's return to Atlantis to pursue and destroy its time machine, as advised by the recently resurrected asteroid. Seriously, Back to the Future 3 much? With the exception of the first area concerning the rarity of feeding another mirror image dolphin a fish to reach the key glyph, the less I say about Fish City, hence the second area, not to mention the only instance when Echo transforms into a school of fish to avoid being devoured by his own fucking indigenous kind. Let alone the returning City of Forever, the third and final area in Atlantis, featuring those goddamn prick ass vortex larva organisms, the better. 
In the latter case, you're best off maintaining a safe enough distance from their stubborn asses as they force open every gate for you to pass through in order to reach the final warp gate before they shut completely. And most important of all, never get too close to any of these bastards, otherwise they'll let off a stinging roar, indicating for you to fuck off, or wind up approaching the gates at the worst possible time either. Otherwise, consider yourself fucked 10 billion ways until Kurt Cobain Day. And not to get all AVGN, or god forbid, grumpy gamer bitch here, but I had to endure the ever-loving shit out of these nerve-twitching high-intensity ordeals TEN TIMES! TEN, ten FUCKING times. TIMES! And seriously, how exhilarating is all that? Nowhere near it, I'm beyond certain, even over the length of, say, a goose's dried-up turd. I mean, it'll be a hell of a lot more exhilarating to balance an entire swarm of leeches on your scrotum while drowning in a giant tub of coelacanth piss blindfolded, listening to and singing Alice in Chains' Them Bones and What the Hell Have I nonstop in a Portuguese-Filipino-Swiss fusion dialect that's waste my Jesus damn time with such horse shit. However, all minimal rants aside, most of what I've advised with the preceding Echo Adventure, in terms of attrition and survival hints, and possessing reasonable deals of patience, precision, and other mandatory traits also apply here, despite the overall plethora of outcomes being altered here by comparison. Therefore, I suggest referring back whenever and however, likewise for the traditional 8-digit letter-based passwords. <laughs> Not surprisingly, there's been an immense, if somehow inconsequential, jump in graphical quality here from the previous offering, mostly in terms of the overall superabundance of environments Echo embarks constantly through, scene after scene, and especially Echo himself appearing to be an astronomical ass ton more realistic and lifelike than before. While the all-new pseudo-3D scenes may appear rather primitive and appalling even by today's standards, I'm going on yet another official goddamn tirade of a record without any chance of retraction whatsoever, stating the absolute motherfucking antithesis! Apart from seeing Echo's fucking rare the whole time, the diverse plethora of backgrounds fused with the often-shifting perspectives of the ocean sea swims through, above and below their respective surfaces, one might add, is nothing short of phenomenal. Ditto for the rings, the marine foliage, the hazard decorations, and opposing adversaries. And since we're on the subject of the latter, not counting the always helpful, always needy, yet at times cocky, supporting sea life, it was like the designers' imaginations have more than ran riot all over Osaka, Bangkok, Taiwan, Shanghai, Dubai, Milan, Edinburgh, and past the god-fucking damn Great Barrier Reef while advancing this well-deserved follow-up. If I had to pick between rambling on endlessly about the always exceptional presentation and rolling down an endless valley blindfolded and curled up in a capsule during Hurricane Irma, I'd definitely be better off with the latter any day. <laughs> Music and sound-wise, with a returning Andras Magyari at the helm, this time alongside Attila Dobos, David Javalosa, and a pre-Nightmare Circus Andy Armour, despite Nelson only handling the Sega CD scores, the new variety of themes is much of an understatement many might deem it, and one I wholeheartedly regret opening up with, no less. Leave fuck all to be desired whatsoever! As is the norm with its predecessor, the tracks tend to repeat themselves between every chain of scenes, which at times tend to deter others from pressing on for the immediate record, but are ultimately suitable enough for maintaining the appropriate moods for said scenes, and then some. The sound effects, however, are pretty much cut and paste, except most of Echo's currently adjusted injury shrieks aren't as revolting here, despite the variation from the last offering only being heard, uh, I don't know, when he dies for real! Anyways, all hiding drama aside, take note of my top 10 songs listed here, with three honorable mentions included. Regarding the replay value, in direct opposition to, and ranking Kaskosh higher than its predecessor, the Tides of Time will more than keep your ass occupied for hours on end thanks to its more intricate scenery and stage designs, its legitimate yet fierce and unforgivable ass challenges, and an astonishing deluge of audiovisual nirvana which defies even Activision and the already defunct Razorsoft's infamous slaughter sport aka Tongue of the Fat Man, Microsoft's Heavy Nova, and, god forbid, EA and the also defunct Enterprise's Sword of Sodan. Besides these, refer to what I've discussed regarding the previous Echo Adventure, as, yet again, everything I've deliberated in terms of its benefits and strategic procedures apply here. And most importantly, don't miss out on the searing yet sensational sequel. <laughs>
Featuring the usual traveling pteranodon, summoned instantly by the song he absorbs from an undersea glyph. <coughs> and it's about goddamn time, right? It would have also been a hell of a lot more invigorating to watch Godzilla descend far below the seas and unleash his trademark atomic breath upon all the Vortex drone jackasses, sharks, more eels, Medusa jellyfish, and the like, while teabagging the Queen non-stop, while Gazora, Mogera, Gigan, Destoroya, Hedera, Angerus, and Biollante shove the globe holder up their collective asses. Being exposed to acid rain with Avenged Sevenfolds, this means war, playing in the fucking background. And that Echo must repeat a certain stage should he get his ass handed back to him in a goddamn Tupperware dish. Protected by their greatest creation, the Guardian shielded them with its immense power. Undeterred, the foe persisted, seeking a moment of weakness. And in this time of crisis, lived a young dolphin named Echo. He was destined to become the only hope for humans and dolphins. Echo, defender of Earth's future.
up, Saget!